And a woman recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by acknowledging progress. I think it's important that we do so. This morning, we've had nine straight Democrats talk to the FBI about emails without asking for immunity. That's a record. And I suspect the reason that they have not asked for immunity from Director Comey is um, they would say they've done nothing wrong. I find that interesting because that's exactly what Heather Samuelson and Cheryl Mills' attorneys say. Um, in fact, they said it just a few days ago. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote it. The FBI considered my clients to be witnesses and nothing more. And then Ms. Mills and Ms. Samuelson's attorney said this. I think this is the most interesting part. The Justice Department assured us my clients did nothing wrong. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you're assuring subjects or targets or what witnesses, whatever you want to call them, that they've done nothing wrong, it does beg the question, what are you seeking and receiving immunity from? I mean, if you've done nothing wrong, laptops don't go to the Bureau of Prisons, Mr. Chairman. People do. So the immunity was not for the laptop. The immunity was for Cheryl Mills. And if the Department of Justice says you've done nothing wrong, it does beg the question of why you are seeking or receiving immunity. And it could be, Mr. Chairman, for a couple of different – it could be for the classified information that was the, the genesis of the investigation. It could be for the destruction of federal records – which came from that initial investigation, or it could be uh, both. Um, Mr. Comey, I want to I ask you this. Did the Bureau interview everyone who originated an email that ultimately went to Secretary Clinton that contained classified information? I don't think so. Nearly everyone, but not everyone. Well, you and I had a discussion the last time about intent. You and I... Uh, see the statute differently. My opinion doesn't matter. Yours does. You're the head of the Bureau. But, but in my judgment, you read an element into the statute that does not appear on the face of the statute. And then we had a discussion about intent. So why would you not interview the originator of the email to, number one, determine whether or not that originator had a conversation with the secretary herself? There were a handful of people who we just, the team decided it wasn't a, a smart use of resources to track down. One was a civilian in Japan, I, as I recall, who had forwarded something that somehow got classified as it went up. And the other were a group of low-level State Department people deployed around the world who had written things that ended up being classified. Nearly everyone was interviewed, but there was a small group that the team decided it isn't worth the resources. Well, to that extent, um, if you interview the overwhelming majority of the originators of the email, will you make those 302s available to Congress? Because I counted this morning 30-something 302s that we do not have. Okay. I'll go back and check. My goal is maximum transparency, uh, consistent with our obligations under the law. Um, I'll check on that. Well, I, and I appreciate it. For, for this reason, uh, intent is awfully hard to prove, mm -hmm. very rarely. Uh, do uh, defendants announce ahead of time, I intend to commit this crime on this date. Go ahead and check the code section. I'm going to do it. Uh, that rarely happens. So you have to prove it by circumstantial evidence, uh, such as whether or not the person intended to set up an email system outside the State Department, uh, such as whether or not the person knew or should have known that his or her job involved handling classified information, uh, whether or not the person was truthful about the use of multiple devices, uh, whether or not the person knew that a frequent emailer to her had been hacked, and whether she took any remedial steps after being put on notice that your email or someone who's been emailing with you prolifically had been hacked, and whether or not, and I think you would agree with this, Director, um, false exculpatory statements are gold in a courtroom. I would rather have a false exculpatory statement than a confession. I would rather have someone lie about something and it be provable that that is a lie, such as uh, that I neither sent nor received classified information, uh, such as that I turned over all of my work-related emails. All of that, to me, goes to the issue of intent. So i got two more questions, then I'm going to be out of time. 
for those who may have to prosecute these cases in the future, what would she have had to do to warrant your recommendation of a prosecution? If all of that was not enough, because all of that's what she did, if all of that's not enough, I mean, surely you cannot be arguing that you have to have an intent to harm the United States to be subject to this prosecution. I mean, that, that's treason. That's not a violation of this statute. No, I think we'd have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt a general awareness of the, of the unlawfulness of your conduct. You knew you were doing something you shouldn't do. And then... Obviously, that's the, on the face of the statute itself. Then you need to consider, so who else has been prosecuted in what circumstances, because it's all about prosecutorial judgment. But those two things would be the key, key questions. Can you prove that the person knew they were doing something they shouldn't do, a general uh, criminal intent, general mens rea, but the, but the way treated to prove, other people similarly? The way to prove that is whether or not someone took steps to conceal or destroy what they've done. That is the best evidence you have, that they knew it was wrong. That they lied about it. It's often it's very good evidence. I, I always want to look at what the subject said about their conduct. Well, I, and there's a lot. There's a lot. If you saw her initial press conference, it all falls under the heading of false exculpatory statement. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but the, the, the director did. It, you started off by giving us examples of things the Bureau um, has done. And, and, and every one of us who's worked with the FBI, that is, that is the FBI that I know. Uh, the one that went and saved that girl in North Carolina, that is the FBI that I know. What concerns me, Director, is when you have five immunity agreements and no prosecution, when you are allowing witnesses who happen to be lawyers, who happen to be targets, to sit in on an interview, that is not the FBI that I used to work with. So I've been really careful to not criticize you. In fact, I said it again this morning. They wanted to know, was he gotten to? Did somebody corrupt him? No, I just disagree with you. But it's really important to me that the FBI be respected. And, and, and you you, you got to help us understand. Because it looks to me like some things were done differently that I don't recall being done back when I used to work with them. And with that, I would yield back to the chairman. I hope someday when this the political crisis is over, you will look back again on this because this is the FBI you know and love. This was done by pros in the right way. That's the part I have no patience for. Sorry, sir.